Welcome to Disciple Disciplines, the podcast about Christian discipline. Soldiers in the Army of the Lord. Welcome to this very first episode of Disciple Disciplines. My name is Glenn Ford, your host of this podcast. I'm really excited about it. It's been quite a while coming, actually. The Lord spoke to me back in the year of 2016 to start doing these podcasts. I had no idea how to do it. (laughs) I am not tech savvy at all. (laughs) But I just said, yes, sir. And he started to teach me and bring me the right resources. And I started to learn. So praise God, here we are, the very first one. Now, this very first episode is going to be an introductory to what you can expect to hear and learn and apply in your own life. Now, a little bit about myself. I first met the Lord Jesus back in the year of 2002. Prior to that, I never heard the gospel. No one preached to me. I did not go to a religious school or anything like that. I did not read the Bible. I never set foot in a church in my life. (laughs) I didn't know anything about this. Nothing. But I was searching in my 20s, right about my late 20s. I really started to seek answers for life. I really did. Like, why am I here? Why was I born? These kind of questions. And I think we all go through that stage at some point in our life, start to really seek the purpose of life. And I really did that. And I really gave myself to really find out answers, like, what is the purpose of life? So I got into all kinds of different religions, like, Eastern religions and meditations. I started to study all these things. I started to do yoga and all this kind of stuff. It wasn't helping me at all. And then one day I left my city in Melbourne, Victoria. So I had this real desire to go to North Queensland. So I went to North Queensland, where I still now live. And I was up in the rainforest. And I was living on this property with this old lady. And... There was a blue nurse there who came like once a fortnight to check up on this old lady, make sure that she was still alive and that she was okay. (laughs) And we just started to have conversations. And then one day she asked me to a birthday party that someone was putting on for her. It was a 60th birthday party. I said, yeah, sure, I'll come along, why not? So I went along and went to this big place and there was lots of people there. And I met this guy, he started to talk to me about the Lord. He kept on using the word the Lord. And just started talking to me about some testimonies and stuff that he had experienced. And I was just really intrigued. I, I was really intrigued because I've been looking for answers, right, for life. And he started talking to me about these kind of things. And I was there for maybe three, four hours. And after I had left there, I was just really intrigued by this conversation. About a day or two later, I'm out driving in my car and I get right out into the bush, into the rainforest on his old logging track. I pull over to the side of the road. I turn the car off. And I cry out. I say, God, if you're real, I want to know. And then right there on the spot, like, boom, just like that, God showed up and revealed himself to me that absolutely convicted me and convinced me beyond the shadow of a doubt that God was God and that Jesus Christ was the Savior. I just knew it. It was an awesome experience my life changed immediately and instantly that void that longing that purpose of life was immediately fulfilled instantly it was so awesome now i knew that god was real (laughs) no one could convince me that he wasn't i knew that he was but now i wanted to know him i wanted to know him so i went and bought myself a bible and i started to read it i just devoured it I never read the Bible in my life prior to that, never. And I started to see more and more as I read through the scriptures, like, this is true, I've experienced this, this is real. And God started to confirm it. And then I started to go to these Christian meetings, you know, and church groups and and churches. And I started to learn, I was just so hungry. They had a service on 8 o'clock in the morning, I was there. They had another one at 10 o'clock in the morning, I was there. They had another one in the evening, I was there. They had weekly... During the week, Bible studies and so on, I was there. I was just so hungry. 
and I was just consistently talking about God, talking about Jesus, talking about the Word. That's all I ever talked about. That was all I ever cared about. That was it. <laughs> My life was transformed. It really was. So anyway, and I just started to do this. And I was, I was learning, and God was using these things as stepping stones for me to learn and grow. And it was wonderful. I, I, I'm grateful for it. But a time came where I became frustrated because I was in, this, in these churches and I was leading in these churches as well, like teaching and preaching from the pulpit. And I became frustrated because what I was reading in the Bible, what I was reading through the book of Acts, what I was reading from the words of the Master, I was not seeing this in the churches. I was not seeing this in the congregations of any of the people that I associated with or knew or loved very deeply. I did not see it in their lives and I did not see it in my own life. And it frustrated me. And it got me seeking for answers. So I started to ask a lot of people and no one could give me any answers really because no one was living it. The, see, the problem was nobody was discipling me according to how we read it in the Bible. There was no discipleship taking place. We see lots of different programs, lots of outreach and, and missions and all those wonderful things, but we do not see discipleship the way we read it in the Bible. Right? Now, how did Jesus make disciples? Jesus did not choose his 12 men and put them in a classroom and then give them lectures and give them a piece of paper with questions to answer and that they, after a six-week course say, congratulations, you're now a disciple. That is not what he did, but that's how, how we do it today, unfortunately. It doesn't work. How did Jesus make disciples? He said, come and follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. I will make you disciples. He went out there and he demonstrated how to preach the kingdom of God, how to heal the sick, how to cast out demons, how to live a holy life. He demonstrated it, and he said to his disciples, now you go and do it. And they did it. This is how we make disciples. Just the same way Jesus made disciples. But this was not happening with any of the congregations that I associated with or any of the groups that I was involved in. It was not happening. And it was so frustrating to me. So I started to seek the Lord about it. And in the year of 2014, the Lord led me to some YouTube video. And there was this guy talking from uh, Europe. And he was doing some teaching. And he was talking about his experience. He was going through the Word of God. His experience with the church. He was a pastor. And he ended up leaving that system and that, and that uh, position and just went out there and started doing what the Bible says about what Jesus commanded, what the book of Acts says about being a disciple. He went out in the streets and started healing the sick, started casting out demons, started to preach the true gospel, the true gospel, not what we've been hearing for so long about God loves you and say the sinner's prayer and all this kind of rot, but the true gospel, the true gospel. And he started to teach on these things, and it really spoke to me. And I thought, this is it. Thank you, Lord. This is it. A year later, I was privileged to be over in Europe. And I got associated with this, and it was really cool. And I met with other people from all different parts of the world. There was actually 32 different nations all come together. And we're all coming together in this one big motel. And we did this for two months. We lived there for two months. We lived there. We ate together. We, we lived together, we had life together, we were on the streets, and God was using us to heal the sick, cast out demons, preach the gospel, bring people to Christ, kickstart people, and it was really, really powerful. And what I saw and experienced there changed my life, it really did. And these other people that I met from different countries, when we first got there to this motel, we all had to give a testimony about how we came across this and why we are there, why we're here in Denmark, in Europe. Because a lot of people had forsaken everything. They quit their jobs and left family, all kinds of things to be there. And um, so we all shared our testimonies. And what was amazing is that almost everybody, actually all of us did, had very similar testimonies. And the testimonies was, you know, I've been in church for a long time. I love Jesus with all my heart and passionately I love him but I'm just frustrated because I'm not living according to what I read in the Bible and there was no one else living in my church that's living like that and it frustrated me. And we all had the same testimony and then God led us to all together to learn. And if, let me tell you something. If you don't learn anything else from these podcasts, understand this one thing. Stay hungry. Stay hungry for God. Stay hungry for the truth. 
Stay hungry for righteousness and God will lead you to the right place. He will fill you. He will give you the right instructions, the right resources, the right tools, and he will disciple you. Okay? Stay hungry. Don't get complacent. Don't get lazy. Don't get comfortable. Stay hungry always. And God will do it. And this is what he did for all of us. And we lived there and we went out in the streets and, and experienced this. And we saw the power in the gospel, like the Apostle Paul said. He said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God unto salvation. The power of God. And it really, really is. And we went out there and we preached the true gospel, which is what? Repent. Get baptized and receive the Holy Spirit. This is the gospel. Repentance toward God. Faith in the Lord Jesus. Faith means to obey the Lord Jesus. Baptism into Christ Jesus and receiving the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of Jesus. This is the gospel. Okay, and we did this and we saw conviction. God was convicting people of their sin and they were repenting or baptizing them in, in a little tub. They, they got set free from demons many times and they received God's Holy Spirit and spoke in new tongues. Then we took them on the street and we then started to teach them what we were taught. What's this? This is discipleship. Disciples making disciples. This is the example we read in the book of Acts. This is why in the book of Acts we see the church grow phenomenally, very, very fast. If we study the history of the church, we see that for over 300 years after the Lord Jesus ascended to heaven and sent the Holy Spirit, we saw this just grow phenomenally, very, very fast, where disciples were making disciples who were making disciples. Right? And we see from church history that it just took over the world. It really did. Very powerful. Very, very powerful. So this is how we were living. And, and when I came back to Australia, I was so passionate about this. I had this revelation. I thought, this is it. This is the normal life of a disciple. This is the normal Christian life. I'm going to live this. This is it. Before I came back, actually, the Lord gave me this idea. I was packing my bags and I just put this, this idea came in my mind. I thought, that's a great idea. And the idea was that I was to set up a little sign that had free healing on it. It said free healing, healing of sickness and disease, emotional and all this kind of stuff, physical pain, emotional pain, and all these different things. So I came back to Australia and I did it. I just got some project paper and I read on it with a texter, you know, free healing and all this stuff. And I laminated it. That was all I did. That was it. No big expense. I, I got some blue tack and just stuck it on a laundry basket and set it up on the, on the esplanade in my city, right in front of this big lagoon, very popular place, very public area. And people started to come. They just did. I mean, it was awesome. But when I came back from Denmark, I mean, I had this idea and I did that. But I sat there with my family and I was talking to them about what I experienced and so on. The first person who got the revelation of this was my wife. She got baptized. And she got set free from two things. Awesome. And then I was preaching to my mother and God convicted her and she got baptized. And we cast a demon out of her and put in the swimming pool. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> it was so cool. It was really awesome. And then God started to bring people to the house. It was amazing. God, see, when, look, if you just give yourself to the Lord, he'll open up doors anywhere. And he did. I had people coming into my home and people getting baptized in the swimming pool, casting demons out of people. People were getting filled up with the Holy Ghost right there in the kitchen. It was awesome. <laughs> this is the normal Christian life. Okay, This is not an event that we experience on the mission trip. This continues through your life. It's everyday life. But it's knowing how to, first of all. We need to be discipled. The problem is we have not been discipled. Until now, praise God. So people like myself all over the earth now are doing this. And occasionally we get opportunities to, to meet up every now and then. And it's wonderful. We come together and we talk about the things of God. We go through the Word of God. We don't talk about football and the sports and the weather and silly stuff. We talk about Jesus. We're passionate about Jesus. And this is what God is doing all over the earth. He's raising up this remnant. If we see in the book of Acts, this is how the church was. And we look at the results today, what the church is now. What happened? Well, let's look at the history of the church. We see that for over 300 years, we see this phenomenal growth of the, of the body of Christ around the world. In the year 300s, we see 
Constantine raise up, the Emperor Constantine. Now he presumably was a believer, maybe he wasn't. He was religious, but yeah. And he now legalized Christianity. He said that Christianity is now a state religion. What that did was two things. It immediately stopped all persecution against Christians because Christians were being massacred. Just because they were believers, right? They were being heavily persecuted. We look at like Nero and stuff like that. Nero was just, just, just massacred Christians. But then Constantine rises up and he says, now we're going to make it a state religion. Now, automatically, everyone is a Christian. But there's no repentance. There was no true baptism. There was no receiving of the Holy Spirit. People were still living in sin. They're going into now these pagan temples. Now they're called churches. And people are worshipping in there, following these same pagan traditions. This is where Catholicism come from, was all this raised up with all this paganism. And matter of fact, the word church was the, the name Kirch, which was given to pagan deity, the sun god's daughter. And this is what these, these temples were called. <laughs> it's amazing. We've got to have understanding of these things. The word church does not even belong in the Bible. As a matter of fact, if, if you read the first English translation of the Bible done by Mr. William Tyndale, the way we see the word church in the King James is on, it's the word congregation in the Tyndale Bible. That's how it's supposed to be correctly translated because the word is from the word ecclesia, which means assembly or congregation, not church. Church doesn't even fit in there at all. But that's another subject, all right? So anyway, I'm back from Denmark, back from Europe, and I spoke to my family, got to do this full time. So that's how we made the decision to do that. We sold, got rid of the house, had a big house up in the country, full bedroom house, got rid of that. Got rid of the furniture, came down to the city. We lived in a little two-bedroom unit. Had two cars at that time, got rid of a car. I gave one car away, the Lord told us who to give it to, gave her a car away. And then I just did it. Went out in the streets every day and just done this. And done with the, with the little sign, set the sign up on the street there, on the Esplanade there, very public area. And God started bringing the people. I mean, multitudes of people come. And they still do. I've been doing this almost three years now. It'll be three years in December. But people will just keep coming. And people are getting healed. People are being convicted of their sin because they're hearing the gospel. Not just getting healed and saying, God loves you, see you later. No, no, they get healed and they hear the gospel. Even if they don't need any healing, they come there just because they're curious, like, oh, what is this about? Sit down, I'll tell you. And they hear the gospel. (laughs) And they get convicted of their sin. Why? Because the Holy Spirit confirms the word. He does not confirm our opinions. He does not confirm our traditions. He confirms the truth. The word of God is the truth. He confirms the gospel. With science following, he convicts the sinner of his sin or her sin. And I've seen this consistently now. Okay? They get convicted. They repent right there in the chair. They'll start to cry and weep and they repent. They call on Jesus. They then get baptized immediately. It's what we read in the Bible. They got baptized immediately in the book of Acts. Not six weeks later, not six months later. But instantly, they got baptized after they repented and put a faith in Christ. Then they received the Holy Ghost. And then they were taught and discipled to to do the same thing. And that's what I've been experiencing this. God started bringing me people, and they they repented. They they put a faith in Christ. They got baptized. They received the Holy Ghost. And they were out doing the same thing that I was doing that I had experienced. They were healing the sick, casting demons out of people, and preaching the gospel. Lives transformed. This is the power of the gospel. And this is what we are commanded by the Lord Jesus to live a life as a disciple. This is what a disciple is. Amen? Amen, bless God. So we look at the history of the church. We see, like I said, in the year 300, Constantine now makes this thing a a state religion. Everyone's Christian. Well, everyone's religious, but there's no, no real Christians. Okay, I've met many people around the world today who say, I'm a Christian. And they say, I'm a Christian, yeah, because I, I go to church, I serve in the church, I'm a Christian. I say, do you have the Holy Spirit? No, you're not a Christian. <laughs> Are you living a life as a disciple, a holy life? No. Are you living in sin? Yeah. You're not a Christian. You need to repent. You need to get born again. I've seen this many, many times, unfortunately. And then when I came back from Denmark, I, I started doing this full time, and I just had this real desire to bring this to the body of Christ. Because I had a revelation. 
about the gospel and about holiness. Right? I had this revelation. I've got, I've got to bring this to the body of Christ. So I prayed about it, and the Lord spoke to me and told me to go to a particular church in my city. I don't like the word church, a particular building, right, where a congregation of believers gather. That's what it is. <laughs> so I went to this place. And I went in there, and I was expecting to see someone or talk to someone, and I did, and the Lord led me to, to a couple of people to talk to them. And I sat down through the service, and they had the, the normal service where you'll see anywhere on the earth, they had people singing, and then they, the pastor gets up and gives a sermon, a message. Nothing out of the ordinary, always the same. And as he started to speak, all of a sudden I had this overwhelming this sorrow come upon me. This sorrow that was overwhelming. It, was just, it wasn't something that the pastor said. Had nothing, I can't even remember what he said, no, no clue what he said. But I had this overwhelming sorrow come upon me. It was a spiritual thing. It's like literally like how someone had put a wet blanket and just thrown it over me. It was just like this heavy sorrow. And I was bawling, I was just crying and crying, and I just could not stop. I had to leave there, get out to an, another room in that building that was vacant. And I got into that room, and I just had this, my head in my hands, I just could not stop crying. Until I left that building. When I left the building, it just lifted off me, just stopped, just like that. And then the next weekend, the Lord told me to go to another building, where believers gather together and congregate. I went to this other building, and the same thing happened again. As soon as the preacher gets up to start to speak, it happened again. And I left immediately this time. And I said, Lord, what is that? And the Lord said to me, he said, that is the grief of the Holy Spirit. And he began to show me that he is really grieved for the people of God because they're living in complacency, living in sin. Some of them aren't even saved, not even born again. I really experienced the heart of God. It was a grief. The Holy Spirit is grieved because of this. We see people in the congregations who are living in absolute sin. They're fornicating, live with, sleeping with their boyfriends or their girlfriends, drinking booze and smoking, all kinds of stuff. It's really, really bad. It really moves me. It really did. And I thought, like, God, what do I do about this? And he started to lead me through the scriptures. And he took me through the scriptures. He started talking about this system that man has raised up. It started from Catholicism. Because it started with the Catholic Church, right? The year 300, it was now legalized, the state religion. And then we start to see everyone's, you know, people getting baptized, baptizing babies and all that kind of stuff, and which is un completely unscriptural. There's no baptism of babies in the Bible. But we saw this because of the Catholicism and all this legalization of Christianity, now a state religion. But then we see Martin Luther rise up in the year 1500s, 1517. And he brings the Reformation. And he starts to come against Catholicism and say, say, no, you get saved by faith, not by doing works and you know, Catholicism traditions. And he come against Catholicism. He was very persecuted for it. And all the followers that he had gathered with him in the Lutheran church, many of them were killed for it. Many of them. Many Catholics were killed as well. And then we see the Baptists rise up. In the year 1609, the Baptists rise up and they say, no, you've got, to get, you've got to get baptized on your own faith. You can't baptize babies. You've got to baptize on your own faith in full immersion in water. Not a sprinkling on the head, but full immersion. They came up and they were persecuted for that. And then we see in the year 1700s, around 1738, we see the Methodists raise up. And they start preaching about holiness. You've got to live a holy life for God. Yes, you've got to repent you've got, and have faith in Christ. Yes, yes, you've got to be baptized. Yes, but you're also going to live a holy life as well. And then we see in, in the 1900s, in 1906 or so, we, we see the Pentecostal movement, right? The, the Holy Spirit's been poured out, the gift of the Holy Spirit, speaking in tongues and the manifestation of the Holy Spirit and miracles and so on. And we see that. So we see that God was starting to reaffirm, reinstate the truth again, back to what we see in the book of Acts. Started with Luther, then the Baptists come along. Now you got to get baptized in your own faith because Luther was still baptizing babies and still having the same kind of services and the same kind of structure that was in the Catholicism church. The Methodists come along. And they say, no, you, it's, you've got to live a holy life. Then Pentecost comes along, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, okay, and the gifts of the Spirit. But what we still have today, unfortunately, is we still have the same system. 
we have the same system where we can go to any church anywhere in the world and still see the same system, same program, same structure, everything's still the same, which is based on Catholicism. I believe now that this is the last Reformation. Because when the Lord led me through Scripture, after the grief that I experienced from His heart, the, the heart of the God, the really grief for His people, He led me through the Word of God, particularly through the Old Testament Scriptures, when He started to show me about this system that man has built, this church structure. It is man's building, it really is. And what man has built, his programs and his system and his way of doing things and his hierarchy and so on. And God has showed me that it's coming down. He showed me through the Old Testament scriptures that it's coming down. And that he will raise up a remnant, a remnant of believers who are devoted to him, who are faithful to him, who are true disciples of his and who will make other disciples. And he said to me, don't worry about the church. I'm taking care of that. It's coming down. Okay, we reap what we sow. Okay. And he said, just focus on those that, that I bring to you. And that's what I've been doing. And he's been, he's been faithful to his part, no doubt about that. And this is no doubt about the last Reformation, absolutely. He's bringing us back now to the book of Acts. We see how God was restating the truth again through the history of the church, through the Reformation. It started with the Catholicism, the way the Holy Spirit was kicked out of the church altogether. And then the Reformation came with Luther. But he didn't, he didn't reform the system. We believe we have faith in Christ rather than keeping Catholic traditions. He changed that. Then the Baptists come along saying, no, you can't get baptized. you got to baptize on your own faith, not baptize babies. Then the Methodists come along with about sanctification and holiness and so on. Then we see the Pentecost raise up about the outpouring of the Holy Ghost and the gifts of the Spirit and the manifestation of the, of the Holy Ghost. Yeah? And then we see the fivefold ministry gifts unfolding as well. So God's reaffirming this truth. Now this is the last Reformation. No doubt about it. This is the last Reformation before the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. We're coming back to the book of Acts. Disciples. True disciples. Now, let's read about this and let's look at what Jesus said about what a, the remnant is. What is a disciple? If you look at the Gospel of Luke in chapter 14, Jesus is giving a couple of parables here. First of all, he's invited to a meal with the Pharisees. And then he starts to talk about these parables okay and in verse 16 he says he said to him a certain man gave a great supper and invited many and sent his servant at supper time to say to those who were invited come for all things are now ready but they with all one accord began to make excuses the first said to him i've bought a piece of ground and i must go and see it lord i've bought some dirt and i have to go and see it i ask you to have me excused Another said, I have bought five yoke of oxen, and I'm going to test them. I bought some cows, Lord. I ask you to have me excused. Another said, I have married a wife, and therefore I cannot come. So that servant came and reported these things to his master. Now look at these words. Then the master of that house, being angry, said to his servant, Go out quickly into the streets and lanes of the city, and bring in here the poor the maimed, the lame, and the blind. Now look into this. Being angry. This is what we're talking about when the Lord gave me, he just gave me understanding of his own heart when he was so grieved for the people of God, for the church. He's angry at this. He's not okay about this. He's asking them people to come and follow him. And they're making excuses. And the servant said, to verse 24, the servant said, Master, it is done as you commanded, and still there is room. Then the master said to the servant, Go out into the highways and hedges and compel them to come in, so that my house may be filled. For I say to you that none of those who, men, who were invited shall taste my supper. Right? This is the heart of God. His heart is for people. He wants people in the kingdom of God. And he's angry when people start to make excuses for it because he gave his life for us to be saved. Now look at verse 25. Now what great multitudes went with him, and he turned and said to them, Now this is what it takes to be a disciple. This is a prerequisite. This is the words of the Lord Jesus Christ. He said, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, and his own life also, 
He cannot be my disciple. <laughs> That's pretty radical, right? Next verse is, And whoever does not bear his cross, whoever does not bear his cross and come after me, he cannot be my disciple. That's pretty blunt, right? There it is. Let's continue reading. And then he starts to say a parable about a man building a tower. And the man starts to build a tower, but then he runs out of money and he can't continue to build it. And then he starts talking about a, a king. He says in verse 31, Or what king going to make war against another king does not sit down first and consider whether he is able with 10,000 to meet him who comes against him with 20,000? See, he's talking about considering the choice that you're making. Consider it. Because it's going to cost you something. It's going to cost you everything to be a true disciple of Christ. Right? Now look at verse 33. So likewise, in the same manner, whoever of you does not forsake all that he has, he cannot be my disciple. Now salt is good, but if the salt has lost its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? It is neither fit for the land nor for the dunghill, but men throw it out. Now he who has ears to hear, let him hear. He's giving an example of salt. He's talking about fervor. He's talking about zeal. Right? Commitment to Christ. But he says it very plainly here, that you want to be my disciple, you must be willing to forsake everything, take up your cross, and follow me. That's what he said. And this is what I did, and this is what many of others have done when I met these other brothers and sisters when I went to Europe. They all did that. They left their jobs, okay, left their positions, if they were serving in churches and all kinds of different things, left families, and they went and did it. They followed Christ. And as a result, they became disciples of Christ by bearing the same fruits that he did. And Jesus commanded this in John's Gospel. We see in John's Gospel, Jesus said, that the Father is well pleased when we bear fruit. Right? If you read the whole thing in context, he's talking about doing the works that he himself did, and even greater works than these we will do. And this is what pleases the Father. Otherwise, the Father is grieved and angry. Okay? So if we love him, then we must be willing to take up a cross and follow him. Now, I have experienced this on both sides, because I was in business and trying to earn a living and make an income and provide a family and so on like that. But I noticed that when I was doing that, all of a sudden, the works of Christ were not being done. Did I love Jesus? Of course I love Jesus. But the works of Jesus were not being done. Why? Because of giving yourself over to other things. This is what Jesus talked about in Mark's Gospel and in Luke's Gospel, Mark chapter 4 and Luke chapter 8, about the four grounds. Remember that? Only one bears fruit. All four heard the same word. He said the sower sows the word, right? They, and those who hear, he talks about the ones that, on the wayside, they hear the word, but Satan comes and steals the word immediately. They bear no fruit. The second one hears the word, same word. They hear the word. They receive it with joy. And they go out as soon as persecution comes, because persecution comes because of the word sake, to stop you preaching the word, they fall away. They bear no fruit. The third group, they hear the same word, same gospel. They don't care about persecutions. But they, they get caught up in the cares of life and the riches of life and other things enter into their heart and what happens? They bear their fruit. So they're not disciples. They bear their fruit. He says the last one, they hear the same word. They don't care about persecutions. They don't care about other things. They care about the truth and the gospel and getting some people saved and discipled. They go and bear fruit. Some 30, some 60, some 100 fold. It's very plain, very simple. You cannot have both. Right? <laughs> you cannot serve God and mammon, Jesus said very clearly. Now, this is what Jesus said. But this is what the Apostle Paul said over in his letter to the Corinthians. Now, when we read the letters of Paul, or James, or Peter, or John, they also refer to us as well. They're, they're written for our sake, right? <laughs> because Paul says in, in uh, chapter 10 of Corinthians, 
he starts to give the example of the children of Israel walking through the desert. They came out of Egypt following Moses, and they started to complain and, and all this kind of stuff. And he says, those who complained were destroyed by the destroyer. And those who committed immorality were killed. 23,000 fell down dead in one day. And he says, now these are written for our warning, not to live like that. Because God, people say, yeah, God is love and God is merciful. God is also a God of wrath and God is a God of justice. Right? Amen. Paul had this understanding and he taught it. And he says here, in chapter 9 of 1 Corinthians, Paul is saying in verse 24, Now, do, do you not know that those who run in a race all run? But only one receives the prize. Therefore, run in such a way that you may obtain it or that you may receive it. And everyone who competes for the prize is temperate or is disciplined or it's self-controlled in all things. Now, they do it to obtain a perishable crown, but we do it for an imperishable crown. Therefore, I run thus, not as one with uncertainty, thus I fight one with who beats the air, but I discipline my body and I bring it into subjection. Why? Lest when I have preached to others that I myself should become disqualified. Very clear. Paul's talking about discipline and being temperate or self-controlled, which is discipline. He talks about an athlete. An athlete is very disciplined, very focused. This is why I call this, this podcast Disciple Disciplines. To be a disciple is to be disciplined. Right? And this is why we have this podcast and have people that you can contact in your area. I'll, I'll give you information shortly about this. How you can be in fellowships and be around other people who have the same heart and the same mind. Okay? Because it helps us to grow. Be like-minded, Paul says. Be like-minded. But he says that he disciplines himself so he doesn't get disqualified. This is the Apostle Paul, right? Then we look over in 2 Corinthians. Paul continues here in chapter 5. In verse 7 he says, For we walk by faith, not by sight. He says, We are confident, yes, well pleased, rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. Oh man, that's much better. He says, Therefore we make it our aim whether present or absent, to be well-pleasing to him. This is Paul's number one aim in life, is to please him. That's it, to please Jesus. Why? Why does he make that his aim? Verse 10 says, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each one may receive the things done in the body, according to what he has done, whether good or bad. Therefore, knowing the terror of the Lord or the fear of the Lord, we persuade men. Persuade men to what? Persuade men to repent, to live a holy, radical life for Jesus Christ. Paul said, I'm making it my aim to please him. Whether I'm in the body or I'm out of the body, my aim is to please him. That's it. Right? And then Paul goes on to say, now imitate me as I imitate Christ. Because people will say, yeah, but that was for Paul because he had a special calling as an apostle and so on. No. Paul said, imitate me as I imitate Christ. Live the same way. Live the same radical way. Discipline your body. Put it under. Don't submit to your flesh. Submit to the Holy Spirit. Forsake all. Take up your cross and follow Christ. Jesus said it. He who loves mother or father, wife or children, more than me, is not worthy of me. He says, he who does not hate mother or father, wife or children, yes, and even his own self, he cannot be my disciple. Pretty radical. Right? He also said in another place, when he called people, well, Lord, I'll come and follow you, but let me go and say goodbye to my family. And what did the Lord say? He said, no one who puts his hand to the plough and then looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. This is radical. It is. It's very radical. And it's a disciplined life. But let me tell you something, guys. If you want to be successful in any area of life, it takes discipline. You must be disciplined. Is that right? If you want to be successful in business, you have to be disciplined. If you want to be successful in raising godly children, you have to be disciplined. You have to be disciplined if you want a good relationship with people. 
You want to be you have to be disciplined in following Christ, following the Holy Spirit. It takes discipline to do that. And it takes forsaking of yourself and your own ideas to take up the cross and say, Here I am, Lord, use me. Right? But it is so worth it. It is so worth it. Jesus said, Don't pursue all these other things. He said, Seek the kingdom of God, his righteousness, and all these other things will be added to you. I know brothers personally who have done this full time, literally traveling around the world, just preaching the gospel and letting God lead them wherever he wants to, and God is providing their needs. I I know people personally like that. God is providing every need. They always have food to eat. They always got somewhere to live and somewhere to stay. And then they move on to another city, another country, and the same thing happens. We see this in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 10, where Jesus talks about this person of peace. And he says, when you go out, he says, don't take anything with you. I'll provide for you. And it takes faith to do that, right? It takes a step out and do it. But when you step out and do it, you'll see it. I saw it when I was over in Europe. I went from Denmark, then went to, uh, went to Germany, then went to, into Holland. And God provided. We had places to live. We didn't cost us anything. People just said, I want to, well, I want to help. Because you're doing the work of the Lord Jesus, they want to help. And God just did it. He's faithful to his word. Amen? So, Paul said it. Because of this fear of God, he said, we persuade people. He says, because of this fear of God, we make it our aim to please him. Yeah? It's very radical, I know, but it's good. And then what about the Apostle Peter? First Peter, in chapter 1, verse 13. Now therefore, gird up the loins of your mind and be sober, and rest your hope fully upon the grace of is to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Now, as obedient children, not conforming yourself to the former lusts, as in your ignorance, but as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all of your conduct. Why? Because it is written, Be holy, for I am holy. And if you call on the Father who without partiality judges according to each one's work, then conduct yourself throughout your time here on this earth, in this body, in fear. So this is what we see through the, the epistles. I mean, today this is grace teaching. And it, people don't, they don't talk about these scriptures, though. They talk about grace, 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 grace. And look, I thank God for his grace. But the grace of God is an equipping for us that we can endure and follow Christ. The scripture says that we have called to suffer with him. Suffer with him. Who preaches this today? We are called to suffer with him. Yeah, it is a suffering to take up your cross and say and deny yourself, resist the flesh, and say, I'm going to follow Jesus. I'm going to follow the Holy Spirit. Even if it's hard, I'm going to do it. Because it's right. God is always right. When he leads us, it's always in righteousness. Always. He never leads us to do something that's wrong. It's always right. It may not work with our reasoning, but we've got to renew our mind and say, no, I'm going to follow Christ. I'm willing to suffer for his sake. Because the suffering is persecutions and so on. But so what? What did Paul talk about? Yeah, there's persecutions, but so what? (laughs) Eternal life is worth it. And standing before Christ and him saying, Well done, my good and faithful servant. Enter into the kingdom of your Father. Amen, praise God. People say, Oh, no, but there's no judgment. That's rubbish. Look Look at the epistles. And then the apostle Paul handed that brother over in the first Corinthians over to Satan. To destroy his flesh. Why? So that he may repent and his spirit be saved. And then we read 2 Corinthians, that's exactly what happened. The man repented. And then Paul encouraged the congregation, now accept this brother back into your congregation because godly sorrow led him to repentance. Yeah? Paul also says to Timothy, how he handed that man Alexander over over to Satan so that he may learn not to blaspheme. Right? This radical stuff. Radical stuff. What did Paul say to Timothy? In 2 Timothy. Paul's not just saying to Timothy about this. He's talking to us as well. We're rereading it. He says in Timothy, chapter 2. Now you therefore, my son, be strong. How do you be strong? In the grace that is in Christ Jesus. That's what the grace of God is for. To strengthen us so we can endure, so we can be persistent. Paul says to Timothy, Now, and the things that you have heard from me, among many witnesses, 
Commit these to faithful men, who will be able to teach others also. Timothy, go and make disciples. Go and teach other men who will be faithful to teach other men, other people. Teach them the things that I have commanded you. This is what Paul was doing. He was making disciples. It says, verse 3, Now you therefore, Timothy, you must endure hardship as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. Now no one who is engaged in warfare entangles himself with the affairs of this life. Why? So that he may please him who enlisted him as a soldier. And if anyone who competes in athletics, if he's not crowned unless he competes according to the rules, we've got to follow the, the commands of God. So we see here from the epistle, we see, we see from Jesus, you want to be my disciple, forsake all, take up the cross, follow me. Deny yourself, deny everything else, follow me. Right? Whether it's comfortable or not. Paul says to his, in his letters to the churches, to the Corinthians, he says, he says, I discipline my body. I put it under subjection, so I don't become disqualified. And he says, I make it my aim to please him. Why? Because we're all going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Every one of us are going to stand before him and give an account. Okay? That's simple as that. And he says, therefore, because of the terror of the Lord, the fear of God, I'm going to continue to persuade people to repent and put and give their life for Christ. Right? Then Paul says to his disciple Timothy, Timothy, be strong in God's grace. He, his, his grace will equip you. To what? To endure hardship as a good soldier. We are soldiers in the army of the Lord, right? We must be strong. And God gives his grace to do that. He says, don't get entangled with the affairs of life, but give yourself to Christ. Make him your purpose. Because let me tell you something, guys. And the Lord showed me this some time ago. He said, the only thing that will not be burned up is righteous people. That's it. Everything else is going to be destroyed. Okay, there's going to be a new heaven and a new earth, right? Everything else is going to be melted with fervent heat, Peter says, and burned up and destroyed. The only thing that will not be burned up and destroyed is righteous people. That's all. So we make it our aim to get people to become righteous by preaching the gospel, get them born again. And get them then to walk out that holy life. We have to live life in the Spirit. Walking in the Spirit. Now these podcasts, what you're going to get from these podcasts, are understanding of that. How do you do that? Okay? We've been hearing from the pulpit, you've got to make disciples, you go out there and preach the gospel. But no one showed us how to do it. I'm going to teach you how to do it practically. Okay? I'm going to be doing some YouTube videos where you can actually see me actually demonstrate it. Where you can learn how to actually preach the gospel to somebody. You can preach to them in a coffee shop, in your own house, across the table, in a park, wherever it may be, and explain it to them in a practical way that they get it, where they, they now understand that I need to repent and get born again. Okay? You're also going to have contacts with people in your area. There's people all over the planet now doing this. Why? Because this is the awakening. This is the raising up of the remnant. This is an awakening that's, that's taking place on this planet. God is bringing people out of the buildings and he's, he's waking them up with his hunger and his, his, his fervency and his passion to serve him. This is happening all over the planet and it's wonderful to be a part of. really is awesome. So you can get in contact with people who are in your area, okay? Through this podcast or you have uh, resources to do that. Just a link, you can click on that and it will show you places all over the world where you can just click on these little markers all over the planet, wherever you may be and contact these people, and they'll help you, to disciple you, to kickstart you. And they can have fellowship with them, like-minded people, and it'll help you grow very fast, very strong. Okay? You're also going to be learning how to renew the mind. We've been told for a long time, oh, you've got to renew your mind, you must renew your mind. Paul said you've got to be transformed by renewing every mind. Yeah, we know that, we've heard that. But how do we do that? How do you do that? Well, I'll be showing you and going through this podcast how you actually renew your mind. Because the Lord gave me this insight some years ago. Understanding there are laws to the mind. And there are laws to everything. All of God's creation is governed by laws. Everything. And it's because of ignorance is why we don't prosper in life. 
It's because of ignorance. We don't see the fruit of God. We don't see this, the abundant life that Jesus gave his life for us to have because of ignorance. So getting understanding is very important. Getting knowledge is very important. Okay? But then you've got to be disciplined to do it. So there's also an opportunity for you to be coached or do professional coaching. Okay? Where we can sit down and structure how to actually change your life. How do you be disciplined? Okay? Having a plan. Have, there are simple ways how to do that to some professional coaching. Because it's not just about you know, healing the sick and casting out demons and preaching the gospel. That's wonderful. That is awesome. But we're talking about a life of excellence. Excellence in every area of life. The scriptures tell us that us as believers will have no lack. We read in the book of Acts, at the beginning of the book of Acts, they came together and there was no lack among anybody. No lack. Ever. And it was awesome. This is how we're supposed to be. Okay? You have opportunities to understand the laws of the mind, how the mind works, and so you can renew your mind. Okay? You can actually renew your mind because you and I, guys, listen, you and I are living the lives we are living because of conditioning. It's that simple. We do what we do because of conditioning. So we need to re renew the mind, like Paul said. You'll be transformed by what? By the renewing of your mind. Now we can say, yeah, but they're already transformed because they're born again. Yeah, that's true. But the mind is carnal. And because you're living by the carnal mind, then your actions are going to be according to what you believe in that carnal mindset. Even though you're born again. Even though you have the spirit of righteousness and spirit of God. But you can be living and acting according to what you think and what you believe. So that needs to change. So I'm going to be teaching you how to do that. Okay? So this is wonderful. So you have opportunities to contact people in your area, have fellowship with them, be discipled by them, and grow with them. You want to take it further and learn other areas in your life as well, where you can master other areas of your life, excellence through coaching, professional coaching. If you look at anyone who's successful, they give a lot of credit to their coaches whether it be athletes, whether it be business people, they talk about mentors and coaches it's because of them, then they are accountable. See, a coach will look at your future and your potential. Unlike a counsellor, a counsellor will talk about your past and all your problems. We don't want to talk about your past and your problems. We want to talk about your future and your full potential and coaching you through that to bring you to that place. Okay, because when you have someone by your side, this is part of discipleship. This is why the Lord has brought me to, to do some coaching, to learn professional coaching, so because I believe that coaching is a part of discipleship. Right? It's someone coming along by your side and teaching you how to do it. And then keeping you accountable to do it. Right? So this will help you to be disciplined. So this is wonderful. You have opportunities for that as well. You're going to learn how to be led by the Holy Spirit. Because I've heard people say to me, oh, I, don't, I don't know when it's God who's talking to me or not. How do I know if it's God? Well, I'll teach you how to do that, okay? That's not difficult, really. It's just understanding how he works and how the mind works and who you really are in Christ and so on. So you'll be learning these kind of things. How to renew your mind. How to live a life of excellence. How to be a disciple of Christ, like Jesus said. Make that decision. Take up the cross, follow me, is what he said. Do that, okay? YouTube videos that you can, you can hook up with as well that work in conjunction with these podcasts to show you practical things. I'll be talking about also how you live a life of good divine health. Back in the year of 2007, the Lord spoke to me and said that three things must change. He said health, finance, and relationships. And after he said that, immediately I started to notice within the congregations and so on how many people were sick. Like every week, we're praying for someone who's sick. Often the same people. Right? So oh, the Lord started to educate me on this. And about understanding good nutrition. You know, sickness and disease is caused. We don't catch disease. We cause it. Okay? And we cause it because of ignorance. And then King Solomon, the wisest man on the planet in his time, God gave him wisdom. And he said, get wisdom. 
and with all you're getting, get understanding. Okay? You've got to have understanding how things work and why things work so we can live a life of abundance, live a life where there's no lack, no sickness and disease and that kind of stuff. But live an abundant, prosperous life, making disciples for Christ and then teaching them to do the same thing. Okay? Because there are many people in the world who can look to Christians and say, why would I want to be a Christian? Look at your life. My life is better than yours. They're prospering financially. They're prospering physically. They have peace. They have good relationships. And they're looking at people in the church and they're divorced. They're sick. They're obese. They're broke. And they're saying, why on earth would I want to be a Christian? My life is better than yours. Right? So that's got to change. That must change. And there are ways to do that. Okay, the Lord led me to some people God had raised up who teach the body of Christ how to live in divine health. Talk about nutrition and the science of nutrition, understanding. Talk about the mind, how the mind works and how we can renew it. Also, how to prosper financially. It's not okay to be broke. It's not okay. There are God's laws that govern everything in life and we must understand what they are. So this podcast are going to be designed on that as well okay i know this is a long one but this is really important so continue to listen also from time to time we're going to be having interviews with other brothers and sisters around the world who are doing what i'm talking about going on the streets and living a life full time for jesus living by faith and you hear their testimonies and they'll share with you how god's providing for them and the miracles that god's been doing through them and some of the fruit that they've been bearing for christ so that'd be really encouraging as well this is what paul did and when he talked in the book of Acts, he talks to the crowd all night long. I mean, even till daybreak. I mean, he just kept on talking and talking and talking because he's so passionate about the things of God. So we'll have opportunities to talk to other brothers and sisters as well. So this is what this podcast are going to be about. The very next podcast is going to be on the gospel because the gospel is the most important part of all. What is the gospel? What the gospel is not? We're going to be covering those things. They're so going to be talking about breaking it down to over three podcasts. The gospel is repentance. And a belief in the Lord Jesus Christ. We're going to cover that in the first podcast. The second one, after that, I'm going to talk about baptism. What is baptism? Baptism is not a symbol. Nowhere in the Bible does it say it's a symbol. We're going to talk about that. What baptism is necessary for your salvation. We're going to talk about the Holy Spirit and the speaking in tongues. Is that necessary? Why do people sometimes are hindered from receiving the Holy Spirit? What are the hindrances and so on? We're going to talk about that. These things are important. So there you go, guys. That's it for me, but it's great. It's been wonderful. It's been great to share with you today, this very first episode. I'm going to be doing this podcast approximately once a week. So if you want to subscribe, go for it. Do that. Share that with people. It's about getting the Word of God out to the world, right? Getting disciples made of Christ. This is what it's all about. This is the command of, of, of the Lord Jesus. Make disciples of all the nations. So get this word out to people. Subscribe if you want to do so. Do that. Take advantage of the resources available. I'll be uploading videos and links so you can get information on different things to help you in contact with other people in your area. So until next time, I look forward to sharing with you on the gospel. And until then, remember to love God, obey the Lord Jesus Christ, love one another passionately, serve Him always, And until next time, I'll see you. God bless.